Hey everyone, so we got some good questions from a site called Productive Blogging about how to sell a blog, and I thought these were some good foundational questions uh, that were worth sharing, even if you're not a blog owner, but let's say you own really any other kind of online business like e-commerce or SaaS. So I thought I'd record a video on this to share for more of the online community. So first question, how much can you sell a website for? So specifically on Empire Flippers, sites are sold between five to eight figures. And at Empire Flippers, valuations are calculated by multiplying a business's monthly net profit by a valuation multiple. And this can differ, the way businesses are valued can differ uh, across different brokerages or different professional valuers. Sometimes people will use or companies will use a uh, business's annual net profit and then they'll multiply it by an annual multiple. But in this case, we Empire Flippers uses a, the monthly net profit and monthly valuation multiple. So if your site made an average net profit of $1,000 per month over the last 12 months and your site is valued at a 40x multiple, your site would be valued at 1,000 times 40 or 40,000. A valuation multiple is assigned to every business and it's a reflection of that business's value. And in general, Empire Flippers multiples on content sites typically range between, well, before it was 30 to 40, but now we're seeing that multiples are increasing for a content site. So now it's, I would say it's about 30 to 50x. And there are several factors that go into how business multiples are calculated. Uh, if you wanted to get a rough estimate for your specific blog, if you've built one already, you can use Empire Flippers free valuation tool, and I'll leave a link for that in the description below. All right, the next question. The value of a website is usually expressed as a multiple of monthly profits. What counts as profit? Does it include the salary you pay yourself and your family, for example? So this is a good question. The most direct way to answer this for your specific blog is to answer this question. Which expenses are necessary for the business to continue operating on a monthly basis? And what I mean by that is, do you actually, if you were to sell this business from the buyer's perspective, if you were to sell this business and you no longer had this person performing this specific task, would that business be able to continue producing that same level of profit without that person filling that task. So to use the expense of paying yourself or your family as an example, if you were paying yourself or your family as owner's profits, as opposed to as an employee, meaning you don't perform a function vital to the business's operations, then this likely wouldn't be considered an expense as far as how the business is valued. However, let's say you or your family member performs a function within the business that once you sell the business, the buyer would need to hire someone to replace that function in order to for the business to maintain its operations and monthly net profit, then yes, this would likely count as an expense that would reduce the monthly net profit. Now this can get a bit nuanced though because Let's say you, as a blog owner, you write all of your own content, but the website now doesn't need additional content to perform at its current level. It's possible that this wouldn't be considered an ongoing expense, but instead it would be looked at as if a buyer wanted to add additional content in the future, it would be considered a future or optional growth expense that didn't count towards the valuation of the business in its current state. Now, this also leads to another nuance about net profit, which is ad back expenses. Let's say you paid for advertising, link building services, or content creation in the past to jumpstart your business, and that helped it to achieve an organic ranking that now allows the business to generate income without these continued services. These expenses may also be removed from the calculation and they wouldn't deduct from the net profit as it pertains to calculating the business valuation in its current state. And this is one reason why working with a third party professional uh, business, a professional business valuer can be so valuable because they might be able to identify expenses that don't count against your valuation. And you can probably imagine if you tried to have this conversation directly with a buyer where you're justifying why a certain expense shouldn't actually count against your business valuation, that conversation can get a bit complicated. So I think it's really helpful to have somebody, a third party, a neutral third party in the middle of that to, to define the valuation. So 
if your business meets the requirements to list on Empire Flippers and then you submit it to prepare it for sale, you'll then begin working directly with one of our vetting advisors. And those are the that's the team who helps you or who works with you to itemize your revenue and your expenses to create your PL, which is your profit and loss statement, and then calculate your monthly net profit. All right, next question. Often the guide price for what a website is worth is expressed as a range. For example, 24 to 48 times monthly profits. What would make a site be worth the lower end of that versus the higher end? So ultimately, a multiple is a reflection of the business's strength or its attractiveness as an investment to a buyer from the buyer's perspective. In other words, it's what a buyer is willing to pay for it. So what makes an online business an attractive investment and therefore gives that business a higher multiple? Well, the primary features that contribute to this are one, stable monthly performance, two, high growth potential, and as a bonus, because it's not completely necessary, is it re the business requires minimal time by the business owner to operate the business. So here are some specific questions that a buyer might ask to determine this. So first, with the stable monthly performance, you're essentially asking, how likely is the business to continue performing in this way after I acquire the business? And so some questions a buyer would ask when they're performing due diligence on a business is, has the business experienced year over year growth or decline or remained steady in its revenue, profit and traffic? Is it likely, is the business likely to survive or even maybe thrive in Google algorithm updates? Or is this business at risk of being negatively impacted? Next, is the business protected in some way through intellectual property, such as having trademarks? How old is the business? Or in other words, how much performance history does it have so that I can analyze previous performance and how it's been affected by other algorithm updates, for example? Uh, does the business have diversified traffic sources? So if, is it a combination of organic, direct, and advertising, or is it mostly organic? Is traffic spread over many pages? So do maybe 10 or more pages contribute to a small percentage collectively, or is it one page driving a majority of the site's performance and traffic? Does the business have multiple revenue streams? So uh, is the business monetized only through Amazon Associates or does it have Amazon Associates plus some private affiliates plus display advertising? Next is about the growth potential. So a question that a buyer might ask is, is this blog in a niche with growth potential? Is this blog in a super small targeted niche or is it in a more broad niche? But does the business come with other assets? Are there digital products, email lists, social media accounts with active followings, employee contracts? And lastly, speaking to that bonus point, are operations delegated? So how much time per week does the owner spend on this business? Most buyers are not looking to purchase a full-time job by acquiring your business. So as you build this business, your aim over time should be to reduce the amount of time that you're personally spending on this business or making it a possibility that you could remove yourself even if you are, say, creating your own content. So on the flip side of this, a site with a lower multiple would be a business that has experienced decline in revenue, profit, or traffic, a smaller website overall. So that might be uh, a, a site that's in a smaller niche compared to a larger site that has demonstrated success in a larger market and a business that requires a lot of the owner's time to operate. All right, this next question is kind of a follow-up to that last one. What can a website owner do to make their website worth more or get a higher price for their site other than increase monthly profits? So other than increasing monthly profits, some questions you could ask yourself are, how close to passive is this business? So this goes to what I was mentioning before about systemizing the business to reduce the amount of time that you spend on that business. I would say if you're spending more than 10 hours per week on the business, you'll want to find ways to reduce this. That 10 hour threshold or less is for the marketing team at least, the threshold that we use to say uh, that a business owner spends minimal time on this business. Next question to ask yourself, is this business built off of a solid SEO foundation? So do you use high quality content? Are you using white hat SEO tactics or have you used black hat? Like uh, have, have you used a PBN to grow your organic ranking? Has your business been affected or even benefited from prior Google algorithm updates? 
Next is, are there multiple traffic sources? A lot of the sites that I see drive a majority of their traffic organically, which is fine. But if you're able to get uh, the percentage of social hire, for example, or if you have an email list and you're able to get the direct up hire, that reduces the perceived risk of your site. Next is traffic and page diversity. So again, traffic spread out evenly over several pages as opposed to just one to two pages driving a majority of the traffic. Next is multiple revenue streams. Again, is your site monetized only through Amazon Associates or do you also work directly with affiliate partners and display advertising companies? Next question, what is involved in the actual handover of a website from the buyer to the seller and how does the process work and what will the seller need to give to the buyer? Okay, so at Empire Flippers, we call the handover phase the migration. And this can be complex or relatively simple depending on the assets that are being transferred because every platform can have a specific migration process due to each specific platform's terms of service or their restrictions around transferring ownership. And each company has their own requirements or restrictions. So some of these accounts include Amazon Associates, all of the display advertising platforms, which can be AdSense, Mediavine, or AdThrive. These all have different processes. Uh, all of the individual affiliate partners, hosting and domain companies. So at Empire Flippers, we have a team of migrations advisors and migration specialists. And I actually used to be a migration advisor. And this team manages the mi entire migration process. And I think Empire Flippers is actually the only brokerage that helps with the migration. And what that means is that in most cases, a seller and a buyer are usually fully responsible for transferring the assets themselves. And the migration terms are usually considered an afterthought of the sale, like you sell your business and now you think that's when it's done. But the migration terms are really important because this usually determines when a deal is actually considered complete and when the seller is paid. In most cases, the buyer's cash for the purchase is held by a third-party escrow company, and the terms of the release of the cash are detailed in the sales contract, which usually happens during the migration process. In some cases, I believe a deal is considered complete when the domain is transferred. In other cases, though, a deal is considered complete when all of the assets are transferred over. All right, what advice would you give to a potential seller in order to make a sale run smoothly? So whether or not you decide to go through a brokerage, I would say first, get a professional third-party valuation so you as the seller know what your business should be worth and you can get the right price. This also helps take the emotion out of this part of the sale for both the buyer and the seller, and it ultimately helps both parties come to a price much more quickly and just move forward with the sale. Next is organizing all of your assets and SOPs to make the valuation stage run more smoothly. So a reason why a business can take so long to value during the vetting stage is because a seller needs to compile all of their assets, needs to define all of their revenue, all of their expenses. So if you're able to enter this phase with all of that information, that just helps the vetting and valuation stage happen far more quickly, which in turn helps you to list your business on the marketplace far more quickly. Next, I would say speak with the sales advisor and vetting advisor early in the process, sometimes even a year in advance. And a lot of site owners, a lot of business owners, they only speak with a broker once they need to sell their business or once they want to sell their business. And I think this is a missed opportunity because sales advisors and vetting advisors in brokerages, they think about exits every day. This is their day-to-day -day job. Whereas for site owners, for business owners, they're usually not thinking about the exit. They're thinking about the operations and the growth of the business. So being able to speak with somebody who is involved in this day in and day out and who sees the difference between successful exits and unsuccessful ones, they can tell you a lot of valuable things that you can do now that could set you up for a successful exit down the road. And I think 12 months is a good amount of time to do that. It doesn't have to be 12 months, but I think 12 months is helpful because let's say you want to make a growth change on your business. Uh, like you want to introduce, I don't know, some form of advertising or you want to redo the entire site. Sometimes buyers will want to see how certain growth changes affect a site. And so they'll want 
even more than a few months of performance to see how the business changes as a result of the changes that you've made. So this is valuable information because maybe you want to hit a certain valuation. And so you think, all right, if I make these changes to my business, I can achieve that specific valuation. Before you make those changes, I might recommend speaking with a sales advisor to determine or confirm that what you're thinking of doing is actually the right move to make. All right, next question. What if the website owner is strongly linked to the blog's brand? For example, maybe you spent years building up the site's EAT based on your own background and expertise. What happens when you sell a site to someone else? The person asking this question said, I wouldn't want my name associated with a site over which I no longer had creative control. So how is that handled? So this is a good question and it gets a bit tricky because well, this is something that buyers will also ask about. So there are two scenarios here. Scenario A, the website owner is linked to the blog's brand and the new buyer is allowed to continue to leverage this asset. Maybe it's just a profile picture or the name listed on the bottom of an email if you're running email campaigns. If the buyer can continue using that and it's not too revealing of the original owner, then it in most cases, that's fine to just continue to, you don't have to change anything and to just continue operating the business. However, scenario B, as mentioned in the question, the website owner is linked to the blog's brand and they do not want to associate themselves with the site after the sale. In this case, you will want to transition to removing your identity from the brand. So that could mean removing photos, it could mean bringing in a team to create content and maintaining operations to separate yourself from those operations or any, I guess, uh, identifying parts of the operations. This can also mean creating content with the voice of the site's brand and not that individual person. And again, if you want to make these changes, you'll want to do this earlier than later so you have time to see the new level of performance on the site and a buyer can feel confident that they're purchasing something that doesn't actually require you to be there. Next question, how can a website owner avoid getting scammed? So I'm trying not to sound biased here, but honestly, the best way is by working with a brokerage or better than that, working with a reputable brokerage that provides seller protections within their terms. Working with a reputable brokerage also usually means there are certain procedures in place that can filter out the low quality or even nefarious buyers. With Empire Flippers, for example, all buyers on the marketplace must verify their identity and their liquidity before they're able to unlock listings. And a buyer can only see the details of a business, which are the niche and the, or I guess the specific products, once it has been unlocked. However, if you're set on selling privately, you want to ensure the following. First is that you're working with a third party escrow to hold the buyer's funds after the sale. Next is that you've had a lawyer to create the sales contract that details the terms of the deal and when funds can legally be released. And next, you'll want to be mindful of where you're communicating with buyers, so what platforms, and at what phase you're providing sensitive information about your business. This could happen at many phases. So let's say this is even at the due diligence phase where a buyer wants to sign a letter of intent, which expresses that they intend to buy the business assuming that everything checks out. And in reality, this is forcing you to not sell your business to anybody else while they're investigating the fine details of the business. Other parts of this are during the actual sales phase or the migration phase. At Empire Flippers, there's a certain order to which we hand over assets. And I recommend handing over the most sensitive assets after the performance requirements are met. So at Empire Flippers, there's what we call an, an inspection period. And that's a two week period for a buyer to confirm that the business is performing as advertised. Now, once that inspection period is complete, if it passes, then that means that the, the deal is completely done. There's no chance of a reversal unless there is something truly nefarious going on with the business. So at that point, that's when you can hand over some of your more sensitive details of the business, like introductions to suppliers or handing over the actual trademarks themselves. So just keep the timing in mind as you're going through the sales process. Our next question, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using a broker to sell your website versus making a private sale? 
So the biggest reasons sellers will sell privately is to avoid the brokerage fee, which is probably going to be 10 to 15% of the business's sale price. Just know that if your primary reason for selling is to avoid the fee, the costs will likely come up in other ways. If selling privately, you would need to create your own P&L and your own valuation. You'll need to find buyers, negotiate with the buyers, hire a lawyer to put together a contract, hire an escrow company to hold the funds and migrate the business. Based on the above, a brokerage might be able to help you with some or all of the following. They can provide you with the highest valuation that buyers would likely pay for. They can negotiate on your behalf. They can provide escrow services. They can create the legal documents and they can help you migrate the business. And aside from the services provided though, a brokerage also puts you on a marketplace in front of a qualified buyer pool. And at Empire Flippers, our buying process is set up in a way where buyers actually compete to buy your business, which can really help to increase the business's purchase price and speed of purchase. Now, this kind of competition doesn't happen for every business. I don't want to set that expectation, but the fact remains that the buying process enables the kind of competition that could allow your business to be purchased for an increased price and faster. Next question, what should you look for when choosing a broker and how do you choose a good broker? So a good broker will provide most of the services mentioned in the previous answer, but when speaking with brokerages, ask about if they offer escrow services, how are sellers protected during the deal, if they offer migration services, when a business deal is considered complete, if they have experience with selling and migrating your specific type of business, and if they have buyers suited for buying your type of business. One thing to be cautious of is brokerages that offer unbelievably high multiples. Uh, if they seem like a reputable brokerage, great, but just know that some brokerages will inflate their starting multiple to convince you to sign a contract with them. And this contract has an exclusivity clause that requires you to stay with them for at, at least a few months, during which time your multiple might decrease if there are no buyers purchasing at that higher price, meaning you're selling at the same or maybe even a lower multiple than that other brokerages were able to offer you. All right, next question. What are the legal issues involved in selling a website and is it necessary for the seller to hire a lawyer? Some brokerages have their own lawyers and they create the default sales contracts and the terms of service but a lawyer might be necessary for any highly customized deals. And a lawyer is also necessary if you plan to sell privately, of course. If you hire a lawyer to draft a sales contract, you'll want to ensure to clearly define when a deal is considered complete and the funds can legally be released and what happens in the event of a decline of the business during the transaction or what is considered a breach of contract. For example, Empire Flippers has a clause where if the business drops below 50% in performance during the migration's inspection period, a buyer can back out. Now, this of course benefits the buyer, but this also benefits the seller because it sets clear terms for where a buyer cannot back out and must move forward with the deal. Okay, last question. Does how your business is registered make a difference to how the sale proceeds? For example, does it make a difference if you are a sole proprietor or sole trader versus an LLC or LTD company? Obviously, there may be things on the money side of things which need to be discussed with an accountant, but does it make a difference to the actual sale or selling process? Uh, as far as how it might affect a sale or migration, one thing I can think of is if you have a business in the UK or EU and you have a VAT number associated with an account that you plan to hand over to the buyer, this might require the buyer to have a VAT number as well to swap out VAT numbers, which would require them to set up a, a UK or a EU company. So this is something to keep in mind uh, if you have the option to set up a US LLC versus uh, an EU or a UK business entity. But I would say in addition to speaking with an accountant and a lawyer as you set up your business, I would also recommend discussing this point with a sales advisor. So I felt like those were really valuable questions. Thanks Productive Blogging for sending that over. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. Take care.